Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the University of California at Riverside. My name is Tom Baldwin. I'm the Dean of the College of Natural and Agricultural Sciences. Uh, and welcome to this, the second in the spring series of lectures of science uh, for the public. Uh, our lecture tonight is on the topic of invasive species. Uh, and our speaker, uh, Dr. Mark Hoddle, uh, will explain to you in some detail what that is. Now, this is a invasive species uh, uh, is a huge problem for agriculture. Uh, it's a huge problem, actually, for all of us. Uh, California agriculture is really nothing short of miraculous. <coughs> California agriculture is responsible for the production of something on the order of 352 or so different commodities, ranging uh, all the way from dairy, which is probably our largest, it is our largest commodity, uh, to uh, salads, fruits, nuts, berries, all kinds of things. The total value of agriculture uh, in California is on the order of $38 billion a year. So it does, in fact, make a huge impact on our economy. <clears throat> now, uh, the uh, work that's done on invasive species uh, is across the country is done at land-grant universities predominantly. Now, what is a land-grant university? Land-grant universities here in, in California are UC Berkeley, and Davis, and UC Riverside. The land-grant system was started uh, with the signing of the Morrill Act uh, by President uh, uh, Abraham Lincoln in 1862. Uh, and you recall from your history what was happening in 1862, uh, it was sort of an unpleasant process going on here in the United States. Now, the uh, reason for the Land Grant Act was to create a university system that exists for the people. Prior to the Land Grant Act, about the only people who, who got higher education were the children of the wealthy. The Land Grant Act the, and Land Grant Universities uh, were created to, for a higher education system for the children of farmers, shopkeepers, and common people of, of this country. The um, universities in general uh, do teaching uh, and research. The land-grant universities uh, add to that uh, an extension component. The extension component came into uh, to existence with the signing of the Smith-Lever Act in 1914. Uh, the uh, cooperative extension, the term cooperative is because it is a cooperation between the federal government, the U.S. Department of Agriculture, and state governments and land grant universities. And so this cooperative extension is a very, very interesting, very important, very powerful enterprise that bridges between the basic research that's done in universities and application of that research in the field. And the cooperative extension specialists are those people who have the skills to be able to go between those two uh, different environments and transfer newly created, newly generated knowledge to, to its actual practice uh, in agriculture. Now, the, um, the, the land grant, or sorry, the, the cooperative extension specialists uh, spend uh, a great deal of their time actually in education. So Dr. Hoddle, when he goes out uh, into local areas, spends a lot of time uh, giving lectures, uh, workshops, uh, demonstrations, and whatnot to uh, practicing agriculturalists. Uh, so, before I uh, go on too much longer, uh, I want to tell you that uh, Dr. Howell, who will be our speaker tonight, uh, comes to us from New Zealand. Uh, he uh, was educated both in New Zealand and here in the United States. Uh, he's been with us since 05, I believe it was? 97. 97? Yeah, I know. Oh. <laughs> I stand corrected. <laughs> and he just returned, I think, this past weekend. Uh, from uh, Afghanistan. Pakistan. Pakistan. <laughs> well, from Close. They are, they're about the same. <laughs> uh, and uh, we're glad to have you back. Great. Uh, so, Mark. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dean. I'll, I'll use the mic. Thank you, Dean Morgan. Okay, just one second, please. Um, 
little technical glitch. Yes, uh, we're already started with the bugs. It's okay. Just one second. Okay. Oh, um, I don't have the slide advance. Do we have one? Yeah. Please. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for taking time this evening to come uh, to this presentation this evening. I know everybody's busy, and especially at this time of the evening, it sort of conflicts with dinner and running errands and that kind of thing. So I appreciate you finding the time to come tonight. And as Dean Baldwin told you, we're going to be talking about invasive species tonight. And in some ways, I'm a representative of this unusual confluence of organisms from different parts of the world landing in Southern California. I'm originally from New Zealand. I'm attired in traditional Pakistani clothing from the Punjab. And I'm speaking to you tonight about problems that affect Southern California. So the title of tonight's presentation is What's in Your Garden? Protecting California from Invasive Species. Now what I'd like to start off with is give you an idea of what we're going to be covering tonight. So I'd like to tell you about invasive species and where they come from. Why do we care about this problem living here in California? Why should we be concerned about new species coming and making a home for themselves here in the state? Are they a problem? If so, what should we do about this? Should we care? So what's bugging California? We'll talk about some high profile examples that are, are affecting the well-being of California. We'll talk about an invasive species affecting citrus production, another one affecting our native oak forest in the Cleveland National Forest, and a newly arrived pest which we have recently found in Laguna Beach which is attacking our palm trees. So, since we're here in the Land Grant University and we do practical research to help solve some of these problems, I will tell you about some of the work that we are doing to try and manage these unwanted organisms. And in case you want to know more, I'll give you some um, uh, websites that you can go and visit, especially the Center for Invasive Species Research. I'm the director of that center and it's here at UC Riverside. Okay, so what I'm sorry. That's right. So what exactly Thank you. Thank you. So what exactly are invasive species? I'm sure many of you have heard this term before. Hands up. Right. Quite a few of you have heard this term. It's not uncommon. Sometimes these organisms are referred to as non-indigenous organisms, maybe they're exotics, biopollution, alien species, or to make it sound really bad, invasive alien species. But basically what all these terms are capturing is they're trying to tell you that we have an organism that's established in a new area. This organism is not native. It's causing some kind of problem to us. It may be environmental. It may be a health-related issue. Or it may be an economic issue that we are trying to deal with. And the examples of invasive species are extremely varied. We're going to be talking tonight mainly about insects because I'm an entomologist and I'm representing the Department of Entomology. But invasive species may also be weeds that infest land or water, diseases that affect humans and animals and plants. Sometimes we have problems with exotic birds, frogs, cats and rats, invasive worms, crabs, snails and fish. If you can think of a type of animal, I can probably think of an example where it has been a bad actor somewhere in the world. So here's a, some examples of some of these bad players that we are currently dealing with here in California. I'm going to show you a few slides which are essentially a rogues gallery of invasive species that are causing some sort of problem for us here in the state of California. Asian citrus psyllid, I've just returned from Pakistan where this insect is native and we're going to be talking about this later tonight. Diaprepes root weevil native to the Caribbean causing big problems in citrus in southern San Diego. You may have heard about uh, Southern California. You may have heard about light brown apple moth, native to Australia, invaded New Zealand and Hawaii. It is now well established around the Bay Area in Northern California. Glassy wing sharpshooters cause big problems here for us in Southern California. Maybe you've heard of the green crab invasion from Europe, which is drawing the coastlines around San Francisco and up into northern parts of Oregon. 
competing with not only native crustaceans, but also threatening the viability of the uh, Dungeness crab industry. Our desert areas are being invaded by plants. This is salt cedar. Uh, ranch limbs have been overtaken by yellow star thistle. Many of you have probably seen Brazilian pepper trees invading some of the gullies on the box springs. And of course, there's Russian thistle as well. Oh, but there's more. <laughs> we have problems with our fresh water supply. We were recently invaded by zebra and quagga mussels, which are native to the Baltic areas of Europe. And they've been moved in ballast water by giant ocean-going ships. These mussels affect California's water security. They will infest the irrigation pipes and the drainage canals that move water from one part of the state to the other. In the Midwest, where these organisms have invaded, it costs billions of dollars to keep those waterways free of these mussels. Water is an extremely scarce commodity in California. It costs a lot of money to gather it, redistribute it, and then use it wisely in the state. These mussels are going to make those problems even worse. Our lakes are infested with hydrilla and other types of exotic water weeds which have come from around the world. Chinese midden crabs which were released from San Francisco because people wanted to eat them for food into our waterways cause these banks to collapse which affect our ability to control floods in certain areas. What's in your garden? Some of you may be familiar with giant white flies which produce all this wax on the undersides of leaves of hibiscus. How many of you have seen the red gum lerp psyllid affecting your eucalyptus trees with these white pustules on the leaves? And the leaves fall off every summer. Anybody seen those? Oh, what, only four people? You guys walk around blind in your garden, don't you notice anything? <laughs> this was a big problem. It killed hundreds, maybe thousands of gum trees in Southern California until we released a parasite to control it. How many of you have seen this in your garden? This is the brown widow, an extremely aggressive reproducing spider which is native to the Caribbean and is now displacing our native black widow spiders. Its bite is not as venomous, but it can out-reproduce the black widow spider here in California. I have these growing around my house, and I'm sure they're probably just outside if we look for them. They've become extremely common over the last couple of years. So those are some examples of invasive species that have come to California. But how did they come here? How have they traveled from one part of the world and arrived here in Riverside and other places in Southern California? Well, there's several ways that, there, that these events can happen. The introductions may be accidental. And we're going to talk later tonight about something, an insect called the gold-spotted oak borer. It was almost certainly moved into our recreational areas by people moving firewood, which was infested with these beetles. And those beetles have now established in our forest and they're killing tens of thousands of native oak trees. I mentioned to you earlier that people moved an established Chinese mitten crab in Northern California because they wanted it for food. Ballast water. This is a major source of moving invasive aquatic species from one side of the planet to the other. These big ocean-going ships are essentially enormous aquariums full of all sorts of things. Plants, seaweeds, algae, kopi pods, all sorts of crustaceans, small fish. Now, in San Francisco Bay, it has been estimated, because of all the ballast water discharge over the years, that 99% of the biomass that is established in San Francisco Bay is exotic. Very few native species left there because they've been outcompeted by these exotic organisms which have been dumped into that harbour through ballast water. The nursery trade, a major introducer of exotic species. How many of you have seen this horrible fountain grass growing along the sides of the roads, overtaking banks. Terrible problem. Very difficult to control. I'm waging a war against this on the reserve across the road from my house. I'm out there with my pick most weekends trying to dig the damn thing up and get rid of it. It's nasty. The aquarium, the pet trade. You know, when I first arrived in California, I had sort of like a little bit of interest in birds, so I went and bought a bird book, and I flick open the pages and I look in the bird book. First birds I look at are like, Exotic parrots from Australia are established in the LA Basin. These are going to be some of the most common birds that you see in Southern California. Because the pet trade brings these in under almost no regulation. People buy them. They don't want them anymore, and they think they're doing everybody a favor by releasing them into the environment. And these, these exotic birds establish and form large flocks. They compete with our native species, and in some instances, they may also damage our crops. Acclimatization societies. 
You know, I guess I'm a little bit guilty of this. I like trout fishing and hunting big exotic looking animals. But you bring them in from other parts of the, country, of the world, you establish them in new areas because people want to get some sort of sport or recreation from these. And recently a huge controversy was the eradication of feral pigs from the Channel Islands. How many of you were aware of that controversy and following that? Huge, great, huge controversy because of the conservation issues that these pigs were creating. So one thing that I'd like you to remember from this presentation is shown here in this map. And the map shows different colours of the world. Where you see red, there are a lot of invasive species. Where you see yellow, there are not so many. And this is a, in a study that was done on invasive fish. The take home m message here is that as the economic prosperity of any country increases, trade increases too. And as trade increases, the risk of unwanted organisms being introduced into your country increases almost exponentially. It becomes a bigger and bigger problem. And you can see here in California, it is red. This is one of the most heavily traveled, most greatly traded places in the United States, the eastern seaboard of Australia, the southern part of the African continent. There's almost nothing going on in the middle or northern parts of the United Very little trade, very little tourism, very few invasive species being introduced into those areas. This tells you humans really are the major reason that these species are being moved around. Without our help, they wouldn't get anywhere very easily. So let's just look at tourism as an indicator of economic activity. And let's look at LAX. Busiest airport in California. And I was just Wikipediaing this the other day and I had to go back and double check my numbers. But it, if Wikipedia is correct, 60 million passengers move through LAX every year. Every one of those peoples almost certainly has a suitcase with them often more than one suitcase. And it's very easy to put into that suitcase a plant, a small animal, a lizard, something that you like from your visit overseas. You think it would be great in your garden in California. I'm going to bring it back and plant it in my garden. And when you do that, you not only run the risk of introducing a new weed species, but possibly introducing new insects and diseases that are associated with that plant. So San Francisco second busiest airport in, in California. 38 million passengers move through that airport each year. 300,000, almost 380,000 aircraft visits. I mean, it's just staggering. No, I can't even imagine how big those numbers are. But maybe this will help you visualize it. This is a map. These are the flight cycles of every plane that's flying in the world in, 20, in a 24-hour period. And as you see the sun move across the earth and it gets dark and then it gets light again, human activity moves with those plane flights as well. So here we are, we're going across the US, it's getting very dark now, not so much plane activity. But here in Europe, a major hub of activity. This is an area that's really heavily impacted by invasive species as well. Can you see this? Parts of Eastern Asia, the sun's coming back to the United States again and look at all the activity. But look at Africa, very little activity in these areas, very few invasive species. So this activity of people flying aircraft and trade and all this sort of stuff mirrors very closely the problems these different countries have with these invasive species. Okay, so why do these unwanted visitors when they come to California become such big problems? Well, they, they do well here for the same reasons we like being here. <laughs> great climate pretty much all year round. Lots of food. You can see that in some of us because we eat too much. Most importantly, a lot of these organisms have escaped their natural enemies. And I'm going to be talking about a concept that was developed here at UC Riverside called biological control. The use of natural enemies to control some of these invasive species. Some are just born bad when they arrive. Asian citrus psyllid is an example of a bad insect. It's been bad everywhere it's gone in the world. Why would we expect it to behave any differently in California? It's not going to. It's going to be a bad player here as well. We'll talk about red palm weevil. It's been bad everywhere it's gone in the world as well. It's going to be bad here in California too. Now some of you may have gone to a lecture last year by Norma Alstrand. He looks at 
invasive species too. And part of his research is sometimes organisms arrive in a new place, they behave pretty well for quite some time. Something changes. They undergo some kind of evolutionary change or adaptation and suddenly they become an invasive problem. So in some instances, invasiveness can evolve after the organism has established a viable population in California. Well, what are these problems that I'm talking about? Many of us have experienced at least one of these. Invasive species compete with humans for resources. They eat our food. They invade our homes and destroy the woods that our buildings are made out of. They compete with us for water like the quagga and zebra mussels. Invaders pollute our wilderness areas. We have some terrible problems with weeds. Yellow star thistle in Northern California is unbelievable. It is so dense, there are some areas you can't even walk through because the yellow star thistle is about this tall. You can't push through these impenetrable thickets. Reduces the recreational value of those lands, makes them useless for grazing. Invaders destroy fragile habitats. The pigs in the Channel Islands are a great example of this, but goats in the Galapagos are also a major problem. We've been involved sort of superficially with some of the goat eradication programs on another project that we are running down there. Many of you may not be aware that some of these invaders can cause the extinction of, of native species in California and elsewhere in the United States and the world. I'm going to show you some numbers on that in a minute. How many of you have heard about brown tree snake in Guam? Terrible problem. Native to Southeast Asia has ex caused the extermination of at least eight native bird species in Guam. Organisms may spread diseases. Pierce's disease of grapes is one, and we'll touch on this very briefly. West Nile virus, which you're probably familiar of, kills a lot of birds, especially crows each year, and it's a disease that can affect humans. Some things we're very worried about coming to California, such as foot and mouth disease. It's not here yet, but we're always vigilant against this. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit about citrus greening, because that's spread by Asian citrus psyllid. That's the reason why we were working in Pakistan for over a month. So let's roll the numbers, as Guy Rizdal would say. Each year, California acquires at least six new exotic species, at least six. That's one every 60 days. I have a new project with the California Department of Food and Agriculture, and we're going to revise this statistic. It's almost 30 years old now, almost certainly out of date. In comparison, Florida and Hawaii are getting these invaders at a rate of 15 per year. 15 per year, far more than you can possibly manage and they cause environmental and economic problems. The cost, of the, United, the cost of the United States as a whole has been estimated at $138 billion a year to manage these pests and because of the losses that they cause us. In California, it's been estimated that these invaders may cost the state at least $3 billion a year. Part of the CDFA project is we're going to be revising this total too because it's almost certainly out of date. 50,000. That's the number of exotic species that have established in the United States. That includes some very beneficial uh, organisms like honeybees and, say, citrus and other things that we use, but also includes a lot of the invasive species, which I showed you in that slide earlier. 42% of the threatened species in the United States have reached that status because their habitats are being degraded by invasive species or through direct competition for resources. Invasion potentials vary across organisms. About 1% of all introduced plants into the United States will become weeds. On the other hand, about 1 in 4 or 25% of introduced vertebrates will become pests in the United States. So depending on the organism, the probability that it will become problematic varies. Okay, can we fight the invaders? What can we do about this? Well, there are several things that we can do. Border protection is one. You come in at the airport, you get that form, you fill out, got any fruit and vegetables? No. <laughs> Been on a farm recently, had mud stuck to your shoes? Uh, no. <laughs> and then you hand that form to the guy, he goes, got any fruits and vegetables? No, of course not. And you think, oh, whew, that was lucky, I got through that, and I got this great plant I'm going to put in my garden, I didn't get caught. Happens all the time. You may have seen a lot of this stuff, bioprotection, border security and that sort of thing. Don't try that in New Zealand, they will catch you. <laughs> they have these ferocious little beagles which will sniff your bag and they will find anything that's in there. So those strategies have been developed to keep these invasive species out of countries. 
And as it's obvious, it doesn't always work because I've shown you photographs of lots of different things that have come into the United States and elsewhere and they have established. So what are we going to do now that these things have established and they're beginning to spread? Well, there's several strategies. Cultural control, maybe we can manipulate the environment in some way and make it unfavourable for them. Well, let's go crazy and spray insecticides everywhere and kill all those bugs. That always works, well, at least for a short time anyway. Well, what I'm most interested in, and I'd like to take a few minutes now to tell you about this technology, it's called biological control. The use of an invasive species' natural enemies to suppress its populations to less damaging levels. So what exactly is biological control? Well, biological control is the use of natural enemies to reduce a pest densities to levels which no longer cause damage either to the environment or to us economically. Natural enemies have been used for the control of invasive weeds, invasive mammals, insects and mites and some diseases, some plant pathogenic diseases. And here are some examples of natural enemies. I do a lot of work with parasites or parasitoids which attack the pest. This is a white fly parasitoid and this female is laying her egg inside the host. And when that egg hatches, the parasite larvae feeds inside the host, killing it. So I'm sure many of you are familiar with the movie Alien and Aliens. Yes, that was not a new idea. They stole that from entomology. That's exactly what these things do. You have something that goes inside you, it feeds internally. When it's finished developing, it explodes out of your body. And that's exactly how these parasitoids behave. Many of you know about predators. I'm sure you've seen ladybirds or ladybugs in your gardens eating aphids. And you know that these are good things and we should look after them. A lot of these insects that are invasive may have pathogens, either fungal or viral diseases, which are very specific to them. And we can manipulate those too to control those pest populations. So this whole idea of biological control is an excellent way of controlling pest species and reducing our reliance on insecticides. It was developed here at UCR. We had a department of biological control. And this guy, Prof Harry Smith, was the chairman of that department. In fact, he coined the term biological control at a meeting that was held at the Mission Inn in 1919. How many of you know where the Mission Inn is? Oh, that's good. You may not notice the things eating your trees, but at least everybody knows where the mission is. <laughs> so that term was used in 1919 by Prof. Harry Scott Smith, and it has stayed in the literature ever since that time. And the science of using natural enemies to control invasive species is still done here at UC Riverside. We're probably one of the leading universities, not only in the States, but probably the world, for using this technology to manage the invasive species. If you think this is a good idea, we have a scholarship. And since I have a captive audience and the doors are locked, I would ask you to consider supporting the scholarship to help students in biological control at UCR. We're being overrun with invasive species. Many of them are amenable to biological control. We just need to have the resources to recruit some of the brightest minds to the university and train them to help us with these problems. So please, if you're interested, if you're philanthropic in any way, would like to know more about this, please talk to me and we can uh, help you. <laughs> so UCR, we have something that is called the Insectarian Quarantine Facility. And you may have noticed a strange looking building as you're driving around the outside of the campus. This is a $15 million building. It's the biggest of its kind in the world and arguably one of the most sophisticated buildings that we have for working with invasive species and natural enemies. Anything goes in that building, it can't escape until we have permission to release it from the federal government and the state government that we have done enough work to demonstrate that our natural enemies are safe and we should remove them from the quarantine facility and release them into the environment. And we're not going to spend too much time on this building because it's, uh, it's really a lecture on its own. So I'm going to tell you, I'm going to give you an example of a of a biological control project. This is the glassy wing sharpshooter. It's native to the southeastern United States, northeastern Mexico. It arrived here in California in the late 1980s. Didn't do much for a few years and then suddenly its populations exploded. Maybe it went under, underwent some sort of evolution like Norma Elstrand has told us about. But when it took off, 
man did it take off. And not only were the numbers of this insect spectacularly high, it was also spreading a disease which was killing plants. And that disease was particularly lethal against grapes, and it's known as Pierce's disease. So this is what happened with glassy wing sharpshooter. It's native to Florida, southeastern United States, and down here into the northeastern parts of Mexico. Late 1980s, it came into Southern California, it established, and then it spread. California then exported it to French Polynesia in 1999, and then in 2004, California exported it to Hawaii. French Polynesians then exported it to Easter Island in 2004, and to the Cook Islands in 2007. And wherever this insect went, the numbers of this insect blew up to densities of biblical proportions, like plagues that you would think that you know, you'd read about in the Bible. Oh, no, 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 stop. <laughs> These are the densities of those insects without natural enemies, and they suck juice from plants. And they suck juice at a rate of three feet per second into their body. They are plugged into the water conducting tubes, and they're excreting water like this all the time. non-stop, all the time. They ingest over 100 times their body weight in fluids per day. So with those densities that are on the trees and that much excreta being released by those insects, this, is the, this was the situation in French Polynesia. This is insect pee raining out of the trees because there are so many insects feeding in there and all the excreta is just raining down constantly day after day, <laughs> week after week. We didn't pay her, not a paid actress. The trees couldn't handle this. They were dying. Fruit production was declining in these islands. And these people grow their own fruit. It's very expensive to import fruit into the Pacific Ocean, especially the French Polynesia. It's one of the most remote islands in the eastern part of those uh, stretch of islands that run through the center of the Pacific Ocean. So we had glassy wing sharpshooter here in California. They started emailing, man, man, dude, we've got a really bad problem here. We hear that you're working on the glassy wing sharpshooter with some biological control agents. Can you help us? I said, yeah, I think we can. I think we can. I think we can do something. So what we did was we took the French Polynesia, this little parasitic wasp that we had been using here in California to control glassy wing sharpshooter. Just like the alien movie, this female lays her eggs inside the eggs of the glassy wing sharpshooter. And when those parasitoid larvae develop, they eat the glassy wing sharpshooter eggs the parasite then pupates inside the host egg, and then when she's ready to emerge, she chews that little circular hole and she pops out, like somebody crawling out of a manhole that you'd, excuse me, you'd see in the road. These are the circular holes after the parasites have come out. So we took those parasites to the Polynesian quarantine facility, not quite similar to what we have at Riverside. It was a, a storage container with a door on it. <laughs> So Christina and I went down there and we worked with Julie and we brought the parasites in and put them in these cages, gave them sharpshooter eggs, we'd just go outside and pick the leaves. There were no natural enemies attacking these sharpshooters. Nothing was eating them. They had a great climate, so much food, and no natural enemies. So it was no wonder their populations went crazy. So after one year in quarantine, doing all sorts of safety tests, to demonstrate to the people of French Polynesia that California was not going to cause another wicked environmental problem for them, we received permission to release the parasite. It posed no undue risk to any other organisms in French Polynesia. This map shows you one island. This is Tahiti Iti, uh, Tahiti Nui, pardon me, big Tahiti, and this is Tahiti Iti, little Tahiti. These numbers are the numbers of sharpshooters we would, collect, would count on hibiscus in one minute. Huge numbers, 129, 300 something sharpshooters all around the islands. So up here, on May 2nd, 2005, we released the parasites that we took from California to Tahiti. Three months later, not much has happened. A little bit of a decrease here, but you can see around the islands, the numbers are still growing. 349 sharpshooters here, 163, big numbers of sharpshooters. Five months later, the parasite is established and it's spreading. You can see the populations of sharpshooters are now starting to collapse. Seven months later, completely gone. There was no way you could achieve that with any other technology, pesticides, cultural control, nothing. Within seven months, our research program that we developed here at UCR exported to Tahiti 
because we created a problem down there for them, solved it. And two years later, it hasn't bounced back. This is going to be a permanent situation for glassy wing sharpshooter in French Polynesia. Now, that insect will never come back to the densities that it, that it once uh, enjoyed. So what's happened here? Oh. So we were like rock stars. <laughs> it was all in the newspapers. People were so happy that we'd done this. Basically, this title here on this newspaper says, Bye Bye Pissing Fly. <laughs> People were so happy that it had gone. So what's happened here in California? Well, we too apparently seem to have had a very good success with the same parasite against glassy wing sharpshooter. You can see over the last nine years that the numbers of glassy wing have collapsed by over 93%, probably because of that parasite attacking the eggs. Every two weeks we go out to the organic citrus and we count the glassy wing sharpshooter, measure the parasites out there, and these are the data that we have recorded. When we get to the 10-year mark, I'll have that magic data set that can go into a high-powered ecology journal, Dean Baldwin. <laughs> okay, we're going to change tracks now. What I wanted to demonstrate to you was the power of biological control, natural enemies for controlling invasive species. I'm now going to describe to you three new projects that we are running right now against three invasive species that are here in California. And I'd like to introduce you to the gold-spotted oak borer shown here. This is a new pest that has established itself in the Cleveland National Forest. It is native to Arizona, Mexico and northern Guatemala and last week I was in Mexico looking for natural enemies of this insect. It's a very attractive beetle and it lays its eggs on the bark of the oak trees and then the larvae of those beetles bore into the trees and as those larvae feed in the tree they kill it essentially by girdling or ring barking the tree because they cause so much damage. And you can see the beetle is actually kind of small when you compare it to the size of a penny. So this insect kills these massive oak trees in the Cleveland just through sheer numbers. The trees can't handle being fed on by so many beetles. And this is what we've seen. Since 2002, over 25,000 magnificent oak trees have been killed in the Cleveland National Forest by the gold-spotted oak borer. It has now spread over 5,000 square kilometres, impossible to control with insecticides. Our only hope at managing this insect now will be through some type of biological cool control agent. So what are the impacts of this? Well, obviously the environmental impacts are immense. Oaks are a keystone tree species in Southern California and a lot of animals depend on these trees which are dying in large numbers. Squirrels, you know, you've probably seen these uh, acorn caching uh, woodpeckers that drill the holes and stuff them full of, of um, um, acorns. There are species of toad that only live in areas with these oaks because they eat the ants that only live on those oak trees. When those oak trees go, there's going to be no ant. Food for the toad will decrease. Little mice need the acorns to get through the year, get through the year especially the winter, and of course, you know, predatory birds feed on the mice and then of course we have things like deer which also use not only the oak forest as habitat but they will also feed on the acorns over winter as well. So it's not too difficult to, I guess, envision the potential ecosystem collapse that's going to happen if we can't control this beetle. And we still lose all these oak trees. Now the other thing that you've probably noticed is, wow, these trees are quite big. Yeah, some of them are over 100 years old, maybe 150 years old. There's more than 25,000 of them out there in the forest now. Summer's coming up and we have wicked problems with wildfires. So not only are we looking at habitat destruction for the animals, we're also looking at a huge wildfire risk now because of the fuel load that's building in these forests because of this beetle. So how do we go about finding natural enemies of the gold-spotted oak borer? Well, to do that, we go to the countries where the insect is native. Mexico, I was there last week looking for natural enemies of gold-spotted oak borer. We've been to Arizona to the oak forest there to look for the insect as well and its natural enemies. The way we look for the beetles, because they're so rare in these countries, we can't find them. They're so well controlled often by the natural enemies, it's worse than looking for a needle in a haystack. So we have to trick them, tell them to come to us. And we do that in a couple of ways. We ring bark or girdle trees to stress them out. And the beetles go, oh, this is great. Dying oak tree, we're going to attack that in large numbers. And when they do that, the natural enemies follow them. 
And we know that if we go back to those exact trees, because we girdled them, we know exactly where they are, we have the GPS coordinates, we can come back next year and start shaving away the bark looking for the natural enemies that are attacking the larvae of the gold-spotted oak borer. That's what I'm showing you here. This is Tom Coleman with the US Forest Service over here in San Bernardino. We're in uh, Arizona here, ring-barking trees, which we had permission to do. <laughs> and the other thing we do is we go into areas where people have been cutting firewood in these areas. This was quite common in Mexico, and we look for the stumps. And we peel back the stumps, and the gold-spotted oak borer attacks them. And here I am, this was just last week, finding the first two of the gold-spotted oak borers in Mexico for our study, so very excited about that. And have we found natural enemies? Yes, we have. We have found two species of parasitoid which attack the larvae. Shown up here is Calistoma elongata. This was a new species of parasite when we found it attacking gold-spotted oak borer. It had never been described or seen before. So now we have that. This one here with the red belly, a tunnel colus, we have looked at that. And just in Mexico last week, we found something very unusual. Can you see these pearls, these little bubbles growing on the larvae of the gold-spotted oak borer here and a few of them stuck on the adult that's coming out of the tree? This appears to be a species of parasitic mite. It makes these little cysts that it attaches to the host and it lives inside those cysts and feeds through them and sucks the juice out of their insect host. What impact do all these things have? We don't know. They've never been studied before. Some of them don't even have names. So we know nothing about the biology, ecology, or impact of these species. That's why we have graduate students in my lab working on these kinds of things. <laughs> Perhaps the most important thing to remember from this is don't move firewood around. Right now, you can go into the Cleveland National Forest where gold-spotted oak borer is killing all those trees and people are cutting them down. They're selling them for firewood. $100 a pickup truck. There's no regulation to say you can't move it from one place to another. You could buy it in San Diego and drive it all the way to San Luis Obispo. And that's how gold-spotted oak borer is now jumping. We see these budding satellite populations that are showing up many miles from the area of original infestation. $100 and away it goes. So if you see, I don't want to, I don't want to take your photo and see you doing this. <laughs> okay change tracks again. Let's talk about an invader that is affecting our urban areas. This is the red palm weevil, just found officially in Sandy in Laguna Beach in September 2010. This is a big insect. It's about this big. It's an extremely beautiful weevil. People, I think, will kind of find it attractive. Well, I do. This insect is considered to be the world's most devastating insect pest of palm trees. And how many of you have noticed palm trees in California? <laughs> That's a bit better. I think the eight hands raised this time. Okay, we have a lot of ornamental palms growing all around the campus and up and down the streets. We have a date industry that's worth $30 million a year. The ornamental palm industry is worth about $70 million a year. But I ask you, what is the value of our native palm oases out in the Anza Borrego? Priceless? Probably. And are they going to be vulnerable to attack by these palm weevils? The red striped form of red palm weevil or the orange type of palm weevil? So the invasion history. What I want to emphasize with this very cluttered slide, and I made it intentionally like that, is you can see a lot of countries listed here, starting in 1920 right through 2009. All these countries. All of these countries have received the orange form of red palm weevil everywhere. It's orange. In California, we were prepared for this insect. What colour do you think we'd expect to see? Orange. Well, we didn't get the orange one. We got this red stripe. So where did that come from? Everybody else got orange, but Laguna Beach and the OC got the flashy red stripe form. How did that happen? How did the red stripe form of red palm weevil come to Southern California? Well, I'm going to tell you what happened. Starting in about August 2010, guys that look after the palm trees started noticing that these palm trees were dying and the tops were falling off them. And when they looked inside, they noticed some big grubs and some strange looking beetles. I thought, oh, this is odd. We have never seen this before. We've been looking after palm trees for about 30 years and we've never seen this. So they told us about it, 
And I went down to this tree in September 2010, dug around the inside of it, and found the live red palm weevil. The first official record of red palm weevil in Southern California came from this tree in Laguna Beach. And this is what we noticed, that they do a lot of feeding damage to the bases of the fronds, and they tunnel up through the fronds, they get into the trunk of the tree, and then as the larvae feed inside the tree, you can see there's hundreds of them feeding, they turn the inside of the tree to mush. And that mush ferments and it stinks. It smells like baby diarrhea. And when it's on your hands, it takes about four days to get rid of it. But you can see the damage done in that palm tree. That tree had been completely hollowed out by those feeding weevils, and of course it died. And this is how red palm weevil kills palm trees. And it's a strong flyer. It's been estimated that it might be able to fly up to three to four miles in as little as a week. So there's high probability that it can disperse from these isolated palm trees in Laguna Beach. We've only found seven palm trees infested so far. And we're doing very intensive monitoring out there to figure out where is red palm weevil, can we possibly eradicate it before it starts to spread. So as I told you, everywhere in the world, the orange form has spread. The question for us is, how did we get the red stripe form? It is known from Thailand, Indonesia, Malaysia, the Philippines, Papua New Guinea, and now Southern California. How did it go from these places to Southern California? Well, what we want to answer using genetic analyses is this question. We're in the area of origin here in Southeast Asia, where this red stripe form is native. How did this happen? How did it move to Laguna Beach? Palm tree imports into, southern, into the United States have been banned for over a year now, maybe 18 months or longer. And all around the areas where we have found red palm weevil, there are no newly planted palm trees that could have brought the weevil in accidentally. So it's like, hmm, interesting. So we did some internet research. Well, Christina did. And what we found is they're a very popular food source. Did somebody bring them to California because they wanted to eat them? So, we went overseas to find out how you do this. <laughs> this is us collecting live larvae from infested coconuts in Sumatra are a delicacy in some of these countries. So you can see how big the grubs are. Like About 80% protein. So now we're back at the homestead and we're cooking them up. So they prepared them in two different ways, curry and fried. <laughs> True, I'm surprised. I actually ate all of them. They were that good. <laughs> yeah, I was surprised. All right, the real test is when my wife Christina eats them, okay? If she can handle it, they can't be that bad. Like you would have a 
Okay, so here's a scenario for you. If you're somebody that enjoys eating these larvae and you go home to Southeast Asia somewhere and you bring them back each time, you're kind of nervous going through the airport filling out that form. Got any live insects? Got any strange foods? Go, no, no, no. One time you get caught, you're busted. So maybe you feel relieved. Oh, God, I finally got them through. Okay. Look at all these palm trees growing around Laguna Beach. Now just let these things go, and then I won't have to worry about smuggling them into Southern California anymore. I can go out and harvest them whenever I like. Maybe that's how they came to Southern California. We don't know. It's a hypothesis. So what we are doing is we're going to use population genetics analyses to answer this question. We have collected either personally or had our colleagues ship us red palm weevils from all these different places in the world. But then we went on our own collecting trip. We went to Indonesia and we visited Java and Sumatra and on to Malaysia, Saudi Arabia, because we were working in Pakistan on Asian citrus psyllid, which we'll get to in a minute, we had the opportunity to co collect red palm weevils there too. So what we found in Indonesia was actually really interesting. The island of Java has the red stripe form and the orange form of red palm weevil in about equal numbers. Then we flew up to Sumatra and started looking for it. We only found the red stripe form of red palm weevil. And the people we were working with on the plantations up there, we said to them, got any orange weevils up here? And they look at it, what? We've never seen it. Like, this, this weevil's orange? And I showed them some photos. They'd never seen it. So depending where you are, the color of the weevil may be all black with a red stripe or a mixture of these two color morphs. Or in Malaysia, anything goes, it seems. So we think we have very high genetic variation here, and we should be able to tease out the genetic variation, look at what California's population is like, and possibly figure out where California's red palm weevil came from, based on these field collections. Okay, we're going to wrap up now, and we're going to move on to Asian citrus psyllid. This is a pest of agriculture. We've talked about gold-spotted oak borer, a pest of our, an invasive pest of our wilderness areas in the Cleveland National Forest. We've talked about red palm weevil, an invasive pest affecting our palm trees in our urban areas around Laguna Beach. Now we're going to finish up talking about Asian citrus psyllid, a pest of California citrus. California citrus is worth about $1.2 billion a year. It's an iconic crop for the state. It's arguable that California's economic well-being, or even the trajectory to prosperity, is because of citrus and the early development of that crop here when California was a young state. Wherever Asian citrus psyllid has gone, the adults shown here and the nymphs with all the white wax hanging from them here, these are the adults, these are the nymphs, they can acquire a bacterial disease. And this bacteria lives in the xylem and the phloem or the food conducting tubes of these citrus trees and it multiplies and it kills the tree. The insect on its own is not so bad it's the bacteria that it spreads which kills the trees. That's the big problem that we're dealing with. However, our natural enemies and our foreign exploration and our biological control program is obviously targeting the insect. In California, we have discovered no natural enemies or in particular no parasitic wasps attacking the nymphs of Asian citrus psyllid. So let's put this in some perspective. Florida detected uh, the disease in about 2005. And within four years of the detection of that disease, they lost 10% of their citrus acreage, or about 60,000 acres, in about four to five years. That is unbelievable. And there's no cure for this disease. 60,000 acres wiped out by this disease in about a four to five year period. Is California going to be looking at a similar fate? There's no reason to think that we shouldn't be. Because Asian citrus psyllid and this disease, Huang Long Bing, or citrus greening, has done the same thing everywhere it's gone. Why would California be any different? It's an example of something that's just born bad. And this is an example of what the disease does. You can see the trees here have become very thin, all the leaves have fallen off, they don't produce any fruit. This happens about four to five years, maybe up to eight years, depending on the citrus variety, after the initial infestation. And the only solution is to chop down all those trees and remove that disease source from your fields. So where is this insect and where is the disease native to? 
Well, some of the earliest publications on Asian citrus psyllid came out of Pakistan in 1927 by two entomologists, uh, Muhammad Hussein and Dina Nath. And a lot of people have looked at this and think, hmm, it's probably likely that Asian citrus psyllid is native to the Punjab area of the sub-Indian continent, shown here with a red circle. And what else you'll notice on this map is that area is yellow. It is considered to be a type of desert. Most of our citrus in California is grown in the Central Valley, which is also a kind of desert, very dry, very hot over the summer, and quite cold and miserable during the winter. This part of the Indian subcontinent is ex almost, well, like it's 72% the same because I did climate matching software modeling to figure out how similar is the climate here in Pakistan to the Central Valley of California where we grow most of our citrus. So the idea is if that area has a good climatic match with our citrus producing areas, any natural enemies that we bring back from Pakistan to establish here in California should be pretty well adapted to the climate. You wouldn't want to take a wimpy parasitoid, say from, I don't know, somewhere, say Malaysia, for example, where it's warm and humid, and stick it in Bakersfield where it's boiling hot over the summer and cold over the winter with almost no humidity. So one of the things we do is we look for areas in the world that have a similar climate to California and where the invasive species is also native. That will give us, hopefully, the highest probability of finding a natural enemy that is well adapted to California's climate. So we have visited Pakistan twice, worked there for a month approximately each time we've been, and we've had some excellent cooperation with farmers in the field. Three cups of tea with some of the owners. Familiar with that book? Yeah. Yes, excellent. And we have a lab at the University of Agriculture in Faisalabad in Agri, the Department of Agri Entomology. You can see us working here with the, with the students that are helping us. We go out, we gather up thousands of psyllids from these fields put them in these little bottle cages and then we rear out the parasites. We bottle up the parasites to bring them home to California to take them to that sophisticated quarantine facility that I showed you earlier. Okay? So we have permits to do all this and it's extremely difficult getting these permits because I'm asking to move live insects from Pakistan to California in the United States in a box that nobody is allowed to open. So we jump on the plane in Pakistan, we touch down in Heathrow Airport and we're about to get on our plane to go to the States. My passport goes under the scanner and the alarms go off. The guy goes, that's weird. That's never happened. So he's like, so, <laughs> alarms go off again. Homeland Security has just been notified that I'm on a direct flight from Pakistan to the United States with a box that nobody can open. <laughs> So we get dragged off to one side and the Homeland Security guy from the United States is waiting for us in Heathrow. So we get interrogated, well, we get debriefed about what we have been doing there and what's in the box and all this sort of stuff for about 15 minutes or so. Everything seems okay and we're released and we get on the plane. Get to LAX, passport goes under the scanner again, alarms go off, we get dragged off for a much more thorough debriefing this time. So it, it, so it so that point shows you that, yes, you're being watched and people know where you're moving even though you don't know that's happening. So anyway, no problems. We got the parasites from Pakistan to California safely. But this was a problem we experienced a lot in Pakistan. This is called load shedding. Now, load shedding is a problem because they have insufficient production of electricity. And electricity comes and goes for most of the day. And if you're lucky, you may get up to six hours of electricity a day. So you're working in the lab and suddenly the lights go off and you can't use the microscopes, there's no water, no internet, nothing. And when it happens at night, well, it really sucks. Because now you have to wear your pencil and work through with an emergency light, which you've had to buy at these shops and recharge them up so you can keep working at night time. It makes it extremely difficult to do these jobs also blows your research budget because you weren't expecting to buy half of this equipment because you had no idea that load shedding was going to be a problem. But as they tell you on TV all the time, load shedding. And the guy comes no problem. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so this is um, Shokat Zaman Khan. He's a master's student here at the University of Agriculture, Faisalabad, and he is doing his MS degree in Pakistan on the natural enemies of Asian citrus psyllid for us 
so we can figure out what are the best natural enemies to bring back to California to fight this insect that's potentially threatening our citrus production. This is my wife Christina and this is our harvest. This is the box that you weren't allowed to open that we were bringing back to uh, Riverside, the quarantine facility. The good news, and I will share this with you, some of the first people to know this, is that we have successfully reared out two different types of parasitoid that attack Asian citrus psyllid. We have established colonies of these in our quarantine facility now. We're doing the safety tests, and hopefully by the end of summer we will be preparing an environment assessment report to hand over to the USDA and the California Department of Food and Agriculture, demonstrating that these parasites from Pakistan are not going to cause undue environmental damage, and hopefully we will be given permission to release these and establish them in California to try and control Asian citrus psyllid. Thank you. <laughs> so, some of the take-home messages. The Commonwealth of California is severely affected by invasive species. This is a $3 billion a year problem for the state. It affects every one of us in this room. Every one of us. Whether it's our water security, food security, the prices of food that we buy, or just our ability to grow plants in our garden that we like. Because they can't live because these invasive species are killing them. And what I've done tonight is I've tried to give you examples on invasive species affecting agriculture. We just talked about Asian citrus psyllid. I gave you an example of an invasive species affecting our wilderness areas, gold spotted oak borer. One that's affecting urban areas in Laguna Beach, the red palm weevil. And one of the best technologies we have for fighting these invasive species is biological control. And UC Riverside pioneered this technology and we're still at the forefront of this technology today. Okay, so these invaders, I think, can come from anywhere in the world and at any time. And it's very hard to predict where these species are going to come from. Gold-spotted oak borer. It's pretty much a scientific curiosity in Arizona and Mexico. Up until that insect arrived in California, it was only known from 78 specimens that were scattered across several museums. 78. And they've been collected for almost 100 years. I can take you down to the Cleveland, you can probably collect 100 beetles from one tree. That's how common it has become in California, and it's a pretty beetle. And there are a lot of beetle fanatics out there that would, that, well, they would have given anything to have had some of those pretty beetles in their beetle collection. And of course, as we trade more and our economic prosperity continues to increase, the risk of these invasive species coming to California will increase also. So I just wanted to wrap up here, mention that, that UC Riverside is a world leader in invasive species research. It's not just me doing this work on biological control. We have people looking at the genetics, the invasion biology, spread, management strategies. There are a lot of professors and extension specialists like myself working on this problem. And finally, if you've got invasive species or you're curious about them, the Center for Invasive Species Research maintains a website where we have information on a lot of invasive species affecting California. We're highlighting some high-profile insects, so if you're interested in any, any of these things we've talked about, please visit the Center for Invasive Species Research at ucr.edu. Just type in Invasive Species University of California Riverside into Google, and it'll take you straight to this uh, homepage. If there are any questions, I'd be very happy to answer those for you. Thank you. Boy, I mean, everybody. Take questions, I want to remind everyone that uh, next, the next lecture in the series is not two weeks from tonight, but one week. It's one week from tonight again in this room. Now, I'm sure there are lots of questions. Yes, sir. Red ant. Red and ported fire ant, yes. From Orange County. Any, yes. Any good progress? Uh, unfortunately, that support for that program has pretty much dried up and there's not much activity going on as far as eradication efforts anymore. There are natural enemies for that red and ported fire, and they're called forage flies, and they're decapitating flies. Those, I think, have been released in California now, but I'm not sure how well they've established what impact they're having or they're spreading. Yeah, so I don't have any 
great news for you on red imported fire ants. Yes, plenty of people over here. Do we have a mic we can pass around so everybody can? Okay. Okay, we'll go here and then we'll come over to you guys. Thank you. Uh, my question is, when you're explaining uh, the pest and then you found a biological solution, uh, how, how does it work that that biological solution does not end up becoming another pest? Right, that's a great question. That's one I get asked every time I give this talk. We bring these invasive, we have these invasive species. I go overseas and I find a natural enemy and I bring it back to California and we release it. And people are concerned. Well, how do you know it's not going to become another problem? That's why we do all the safety testing in the quarantine facility. The, often the only food that those natural enemies will eat is the pest. And when the pest populations collapse, the natural enemy populations follow those decreasing pest populations as well. So that example that I showed you in Tahiti, for example, you remember the pissing fly? and how it disappeared around the islands within seven months of us releasing that parasite. Before we released that, we spent one year in the quarantine facility making sure it posed no undue risk to any other insects in French Polynesia. That parasite now is almost as rare as the glassy winged sharpshooter. So they essentially follow each other like this. It's almost a classic populations dynamics kind of event. Thank you. Okay. Right, that's, a, that's an excellent question. The adult beetle can probably stay in the logs for maybe two to three months, Vanessa. After it's been cut, cut down, they go into their pupil stage. Yes, so after the log has been cut, and if those beetles have pupated in that log, that log could potentially be infected for up to maybe two to three months. As those beetles finish their pupation, if it's in a cold area where the temperatures are low and the beetles can't develop very quickly, that potential infectivity period will be longer. Yeah, so just cutting the tree immediately is not going to kill the beetles. They will continue to live in those cut logs for some time. Yes, oh, here comes the microphone so everybody can hear the question. Thank you. Uh, I'm standing on the shoulders of some bigger people. Well, thank you. Um, I think we've done a bit of a, a transfer because I grew up here and I've lived in New Zealand for the oh, past okay. 15 years. All right, great. So I'm always astounded how little biosecurity there is when I come into California. Mm, it's true. And I just came back from a cruise in the Caribbean and there was virtually no control and I accidentally walked in a cheese pod. Sure. And I was really quite nervous about it, but no one checked my bag. Right. And the fact that you said that there's no regulation on um, transferring the, the firewood, so why can't you get some regulation right. that's on that pretty quickly? Right. That, that's an excellent question. So let's deal with the firewood issue first. There is an organization called don'tmovefirewood.org and they're pushing hard to make intrastate and interstate movement of firewood, if not illegal, very difficult to do. But there's not much support for that because there's, it's a business selling firewood. And business seems to be given special dispensations at times to do things that we know are not good for us, for the environment, for the Commonwealth of California. And I was talking to one agricultural commissioner about this issue. I said, well, if you had the, he has the power. He could confiscate a load of wood if he wanted to. And I said, why don't you do that? And he goes, could you imagine what that would cause us the problems that would cause us, we're already underfinanced. Then we'd probably end up in court fighting about who owns the firewood and whether we really had the authority to do that. And during all that time, we're having to pay to store that firewood somewhere in case we have to give it back to the person. It's not worth it. We just prefer just to let it happen. It's like, okay, well then that's probably how most of these regulators feel about trying to move the firewood around. Now coming into LAX, we hand over your form, you're right, I'm, sometimes I'm very surprised at how easy it is just to move right through customs. And I think the, the issue with that is, there's just too many people. They can't look at everybody's bags. But you said New Zealand, I know that, you know, I get scared, I'm bringing nothing in New right, Zealand. Right, exactly. They, 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 want, they whack down enormous fines 
yes, that's true. They do big fines. They have the dogs that sniff your bags, and everybody's bag is x-rayed before it leaves the airport. But that technology is just not adopted at LAX. And I think, I don't know, cost is obviously part of the reason. The other thing, I think the statistics, 63 million people yeah. move through that airport a year. New Zealand never gets that number of visits, not even close. So each time there's one or two planes land, they might have several hundred people they need to look at, very manageable. If you've ever been at LAX when like the planes from China arrive and the planes from Europe arrive all at once, or the, the hundreds of people, maybe low numbers of thousands, I don't know, all queued up waiting to move through customs. It's just, I think that's just the part of the price you pay for being extremely prosperous economically and having very high tourism. And I showed you all those planes flying around. If you looked at New Zealand, it had nowhere near as many planes <laughs> as Europe and the United States. Yes? On a street, uh, can you speak into the mic, please? If you get permission to release the biological hmm. control on the system, yes. how do you go about releasing it? I mean, like, how much and where? And wow, we have an invasion biologist here. <laughs> that is a, that's a great question, and it's a great question because that is a critical uh, piece of research that needs to be done. There's a whole other talk we could have about founding populations and how often does something need to be introduced before it establishes. As a rule of thumb, some experiments have shown that if you make a few releases of a lot of individuals, maybe like a hundred parasites three or four times, often that's enough to establish them in a given area. So we will be basing some of our release strategies on work that other scientists have done specifically to answer those questions that, that you just brought up. Yeah. Yes? Uh, on the firewood, is there any way to kill the, on the firewood, is there any way to kill the, the larvae or the beetle right. before transporting them? Yeah. Right, so the question is, I didn't hear it, if you've got an infested oak log, is there some way you can kill the beetles that are living in that log before you move it? Tom Coleman with the US Forest Service over here in San Bernardino has been looking at that very question. So they have put logs and they put black plastic over it to see if they could cook them in the sun. That kind of works, but not as well as we would like. The other thing he did was he put them in a chipper to <laughs> cut the logs up to about this size, and most of the beetles were ground up when they did that. But nobody wants to buy firewood that's <laughs> this big. So, no. There appears to be no cost-effective foolproof solution for disinfesting logs that have gold-spotted oak borer larvae living inside them. Is that right, Vanessa? Yeah, I've recommended that um, you don't move firewood out of any area that's harmful to other forest for at least two years. Wow, so there you go. So Vanessa's in my lab and she's working on the gold-spotted oak borer and she's been working with Tom a lot. So the recommendation is that you shouldn't move wood for up to two years if it's in an infested area just to be sure that the beetles have died. Yes? Um, are they ever found in meat viruses, or is it just in plants? Sorry, what's that? Is it ever found in meat, or is it just in plants? What's that? The viruses or the beetles? Uh, the beetles only eat oak trees, and the disease that I was talking about that kills the citrus can only live in citrus. It'll never... If you were to eat an orange off a tree that had the, the citrus greening or the huang long thing, it won't make you sick. There's no human health hazard for any of these things that I've talked about tonight, even the parasitic wasps, none of them pose any human risk. You talked about this carbon of homeland security, so the question has to be asked, going the other direction, have they contacted you for any concerns about use of insects or entomology as a potential <laughs> biological threat worldwide? No, no, I've never been consulted or asked even at a cursory level about bioterrorism using insect pests. Is there any particular organism that has the potentiality to do so? Oh, well, yes, there are. And I will give you some examples of where people think this has happened. So, for example, in Cuba, they had a problem with something called Thrips palmi, which is a very small insect which spreads viral diseases and eats all sorts of plants. The Cubans accused the United States of flying over in planes and dousing their country with millions of Thrips palmi probably unlikely. That insect's extremely va uh, vagile. It can move very well on its own. The Russians accused the United States of releasing Colorado potato beetle into the... That's an insect that's native to the United States. 
eats potatoes and tomatoes, an extremely devastating insect, and it made its way to Europe. And I think some people sort of implied that perhaps this was a CIA act of bioterrorism. Now, if you're interested in that sort of stuff, there is a book written by a guy called Jeffrey Lockwood, who's a professor at the University of either Wyoming or Nebraska, and it's called Six-Legged Weapons which reviews the whole history of insect warfare and bioterrorism using insects. So it's a big book with a lot of interesting examples. So if you want the nitty gritty on that stuff, Six Legged Weapons by Jeffrey Lockwood, and you can read it in one weekend. Yeah, leisure reading, exactly. Yes, you're welcome. I was in uh, Colorado Rockies last summer, right. and uh, the trees there, logical pines are being just hammered by right. the Pine beetles. I understand yep. that's true of all the Rockies. Yep. Do you know of any research on those? On right. There? That's an area that's been intensively researched, and we've had similar problems here in the San Bernardino Mountains as well. And I think the, if anybody knows about this more than me, please correct me. But I think the collective wisdom is that a lot of these pine tree stands have been too well managed right. for fire, and the densities of these trees are unnaturally high, and there's just too much stress on the plants because they're competing for water, sunlight, the densities are so tight that they're extremely vulnerable to like these mega outbreaks of these beetles, which normally they wouldn't experience if there was regular fire, which would thin out these incredibly dense stands of pine trees. Yeah. Well, this poor guy has been standing up here for almost an hour and a half. Um, so I really appreciate uh, you giving the talk, Mark, and I appreciate the work you do. Great. So, Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you.